On this episode of the Discover the Word podcast, Daniel Ryan Day wants the group to talk about an alternative strategy for handling life's difficult times, you know, when it's really, really stressful. Because what do we normally do in those times, Daniel asks? What's kind of our default as humans? I think our first response to a situation is, okay, what do I have to do to fix this? Yeah, that's mm-hmm. uh, And that creates a huge amount of internal pressure, especially yeah. when you're dealing with a situation you have no way of fixing. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. You still feel like that's your job to fix it. You know, especially if it's a kid or a mentee or a loved one or a problem. Because I'd Mm -hmm. like to control this. I need to handle this. And so is there another strategy, another way for us to approach those high stress, anxiety producing, out of our control, I don't think I can fix this kind of situations? I think we'll discover that there is in the conversations on this Discover the Word podcast. And welcome to Discover the Word, the small group Bible study from Our Daily Bread Ministries. And as I said, Daniel Ryan Day is leading the conversations with Bill Crowder and Elisa Morgan and Rasul Berry, in which he'll take us to a psalm, Psalm 62, that gives an alternative strategy for life's difficult times. And in a lot of ways, should this be our primary plan rather than our backup? Well, I'm almost hesitant to give you the title for this week's study. It is Waiting in Silent Rest for God. Yeah, because that may not sound like it's a strategy at all. Waiting in silence? Hmm. That's a long way from our default position for sure. But I hope you'll hear us out on this. And I think spending the next hour together talking about waiting in silent rest for God will get us asking some deeper questions. And so let's pull our chairs up with the group as Daniel begins by kind of getting a pulse on how everyone feels about waiting in general. How much do you all like waiting? (laughs) (laughs) It's my favorite thing. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Not really. (laughs) I'm a very impatient person. Mm. So waiting kind of cuts across the grain of my mind and my soul and my heart. It just, Mm. I find it sometimes excruciating depending on what it is I'm waiting for. Mm. Yeah. Can I make it more excruciating for you? Go for it. Now, when was the last time you found yourself waiting in silence when you didn't have your phone, Mm. you didn't have a book, Mm -hmm. there's no music to listen to, no other distraction, no one around. All you had to do was just sit there. It doesn't happen, really, because we take our phones with us. They're in our pockets mm-hmm. or, you know, wherever. But I have a an issue with my neck at times. But I have found the only help is to lay on what's a portable traction thing. Mm. And I have to lay down. And I can have the TV on and the news on or something if I want to. But I try to not do that. And I have to do it for 10 minutes. And it becomes a meditative practice, you know, Mm -hmm. where I lay down and I try to start out and go, what do you want to say, God? But boy, you know, if I didn't have the physical ailment, would I do that? Mm. Yeah, one of the frustrating moments in my day is when I go through the turnstile in the subway, Mm -hmm. get down the steps right as the train is leaving. (laughs) (laughs) And... For some reason, maybe my phone battery is on like 2%, so Mm -hmm. I can't really Mm -hmm. risk like Mm -hmm. just idle time. And now I'm just like waiting, Mm -hmm. you know. That's a great illustration. Yeah, I was thinking of trans-Pacific plane flights. Mm -hmm. When you're on a 16-hour flight and you're to the point where you don't want to eat another meal, you can't watch another movie, you don't want to read anything else, and you just find yourself just sitting there. I think for me... The kind of time you're describing is a time that's enforced, not chosen. True. Mm. Yeah, when it shows up unexpected, especially. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, because sometimes we prepare for times of quiet, Mm -hmm. and that usually is a little more welcome. Mm -hmm. Although I don't know about for you all, but for me, when I end up in those spaces, there's like a little bit of anxiousness that I begin to feel, Mm -hmm. and my mind just starts going crazy, Mm -hmm. especially if I'm trying to do it intentionally and just spend time with the Lord and be in the quiet. Like I start thinking of things that I didn't do 10 years ago, (laughs) right? Or whatever. It's like our brains just fill that space with so many thoughts. Mm -hmm. And so today I've got some really good news. 
The Bible encourages us to wait <laughs> in silence for God. And somehow that's a really good thing. And so that's what we're going to explore this week. And for anybody that hears that and is just like, I do not want silence. I would encourage you to stick with it anyway. So what I'd like to do is just read Psalm 62. There's a lot of places in scripture that actually talk about quiet places. I think of Elijah when there's all this craziness that happens, but God meets him in this sheer silence. Or some of the Psalms that talk about finding a quiet place uh, to Mm -hmm. be with God. This is just another one of those places, but it pulls together two ideas, which is both waiting and silence. So let's read Psalm 62, and we'll we'll just go around. And Elisa, you'll notice at the end of the section I kind of pulled out from you, there's a holy pause, a a selah. So maybe, Bill, before you jump in, just give a moment of quiet there, and then same after Bill's Rasul, you see that other holy pause there. So this is Psalm 62. For God alone, my soul waits in silence. From him comes my salvation. He alone is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall never be shaken. How long will you assail a person? Will you batter your victim, all of you, as you would a leaning wall, a tottering fence? Their only plan is to bring down a person of prominence. They take pleasure in falsehood. They bless with their mouths, but inwardly they curse. Selah. For God alone my soul waits in silence, for my hope is from him. He alone is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be shaken. On God rests my deliverance and my honor, my mighty rock. My refuge is in God. Trust in him at all times, O people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. Sila. Those of low estate are but a breath. Those of high estate are a delusion. In the balances they go up. They are together lighter than a breath. Put no confidence in extortion and set no vain hopes on robbery. If riches increase, do not set your heart on them. Once God has spoken, twice I have heard this that power belongs to God, and steadfast love belongs to you, O Lord, for you repay to all according to their work. Ooh, so waiting and silence together. I don't know if you noticed this when we read it, but Elisa, your first section starts with, for God alone, my soul waits in silence, from him comes my salvation. Mm-hmm. Bill, your section almost starts the same way, but mm-hmm. it's a little different. What is what is the difference? Well, there? the difference is my hope is from him mm, as yeah. opposed to salvation. Mm. Yes, we have two ideas there, and we'll be exploring that throughout our conversations. From him comes my salvation. From him comes my hope. But both of those somehow are experienced in waiting for God in silence. I also want to point out too, Elisa, I asked you to read out of the NRSV for our reading together, but you often have the NIV in front of you. And if you look at verse one, what does it say in 62 verse one in your translation? It says, truly my soul finds rest in God. My salvation comes from him. Yeah, so just a little bit different. So for God alone, my soul waits in silence. Mm -hmm. And then in yours, my soul finds rest in God. So there's a little bit of a difference there. And we see that kind of in verse five too. Could you read verse Mm -hmm. five in the NIV? Yes, my soul find rest in God. My hope comes from him. Yeah, so we have two different ideas. We have waiting in silence and rest in God. And the reason for that is, is because that word that's being used there expresses a bigger idea than we can get in just a few English words. And so translators have made an interpretive decision of one of them is wait in silence and one is rest in God. But if we look at that idea in the Hebrew, what we find is that the word can be translated waiting in silence, resting in silence, resting in God. And so there's a little bit more of an idea there of it's not just waiting, but it's like a waiting that's tied to some kind of like resting Mm. Mm. as well. And that feels different than waiting when you're like waiting outside of an ER for someone who just went in that you care about and you're waiting for answers. That's like sometimes an anxious waiting this is like a, a restful waiting. Well, it also sounds like it has an end product by itself, which means it's an action. So yeah. as I wait, I rest or I get rest. 
What I thought of as you were talking about that, Daniel, is the invitation that Jesus gives us. Come to me, all who are weary and greatly burdened, and I will give you rest. Mm -hmm. And so the rest here is being offered by God the Father, but Jesus offers rest in his Mm -hmm. presence too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I thought it might be helpful to kind of reword it in a way to bring both of those ideas in. And so the way this verse could read is, my soul waits in silent rest for God for him alone to show up and save us, which brings a little more nuance to that, Mm -hmm, I think. mm -hmm. So my soul waits in silent rest for God alone. Now, how is that different than the way we typically respond when things are stressful or when we need help or whatever? What's kind of our default as humans? (laughs) I think our first response to a situation is, okay, what do I have to do to fix this? Yeah, Mm -hmm. that's honest. Uh, And that creates a huge amount of internal pressure, especially when you're dealing with a situation you have no way of fixing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You still feel like that's your job to fix it. You know, especially if it's a kid or a mentee or a loved one or a problem, because I'd Mm -hmm. like to control this and I'd like to get out of the waiting. So to get out of the waiting, I need to handle this. Yeah. And what about how do we spend time with God in desperate situations typically? <laughs> I think uh, the crying out, you uh, know, mm-hmm. that yeah. sense of like, that's when prayer gets real. Yeah. Me, <laughs> yeah. It's like, and they get real, like to the point, <laughs> like, mm-hmm. Lord help. Yeah. I need yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of desperate words, typically a lot of words. Mm. For some of us, we talk to God a lot more yep. in those seasons than we do in other seasons. And so what do we see the psalmist here inviting us to do in a situation where he's feeling a lot of pressure? Wait in silence. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, are words bad to use when we're in an anxious situation and talk to God? Well, apparently not, because right after he says (laughs) he waits in silence, he says a lot of words. Yeah, right. (laughs) (laughs) Yep. And if we were to take away all of the cries of desperation in the Bible... We have a lot shorter of a book. Mm -hmm. And so obviously there's something very good about us being Mm -hmm. able to express to God. And not just the Bible, but the book of Psalms in particular. In particular, yeah. So much of that is prayers of desperation. Yeah. So obviously crying out to God is something very good for us to do and healthy and all that. But I think sometimes what we miss is what this Psalm is inviting us to do, which is to wait in silent rest for God. If you think about silence and what that could look like, as we wait for God, what would that communicate to God or to others or to ourselves that if we're in this moment of like overwhelmedness or stress, what makes sitting in silent rest with God in that situation different than crying out to him? That his words are more important than ours. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There really is a third action maybe woven in, braided in, if you will, listening, you know, to really listen. listen. Because if, if we're silent, I mean, we can't, we're not capable of being comatose. We'll go to sleep, right? Yep. But to listen, to actively listen. Mm-hmm. I think about how Jesus was silent before his accusers. Mm. And that would be very difficult for me because I want to defend myself. Right. And so silence also has this real expression mm. of trust mm-hmm. that says, I'm not going to fight my battles. Be still mm. and know that I am God. Yeah. So it's like a very strong statement of trust and confidence in God to be Mm. quiet in a situation like what you're Mm. describing or in any anxious situation. I also think of it as pretty humble to Bill's point of God's words might be more important than my words. Elisa, to your point of listening, maybe instead of me doing the talking, Mm -hmm. I should listen more. So there's like Mm -hmm. a built-in humility. Yeah. The only thing I would say is that I don't think the word might (laughs) needs to be in there. I don't (laughs) think his words might be more important than mine. They are. They clearly yeah. are. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then I think there's also this way in which it indicates kind of a mature relationship. Because if you think about relationships that grow over time, one of the characteristics of those relationships is words aren't as necessary in the long run. Sure, you need them at times. But you see that older couple just you sitting just there. just me, folks. <laughs> <laughs> that are just content to be in each other's presence. Yeah. And they don't need to say all the words that maybe they said when they were first dating and getting to know each other and stuff like that. And so it's this like picture of of trust. It's a picture of humility. It's a picture of mature relationship. And throughout church history, this has actually been one of the forms of prayer that Christians have practiced since the beginning, which is just sitting or resting or waiting in God's presence, trusting that he's there and around them. So this week, I'd like to explore what it could look like 
to wait in silent rest for God, to hear God's invitation, and to trust him that he is there and that he'll show up, especially when we need him. What comes to your mind when you think of the word salvation? That depends. Okay. Depends on whether you're talking about the Old Testament or the New Testament, because hmm. in the New Testament, salvation normally refers to salvation from sin. But in the Old Testament, the word salvation speaks of rescue from some temporal trouble, like Israel being rescued from Egypt mm-hmm. or David being rescued from the claws of a lion or something. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You went straight to the Bible, too. Um, Sorry about that. No, that's good. <laughs> uh, but what is that word used outside of the Bible? Yeah, uh, I think in the kind of common vernacular, say, oh, you, you were my salvation because you, mm. I couldn't find my keys and you found them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's so good <laughs> and sad. Yeah. 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 So it's a word that sometimes we think of only through a Christian lens, but mm-hmm. it has more meaning outside of that mm-hmm. and maybe influenced by mm-hmm. the Bible. And maybe we kind of have it rooted there. But yeah, to Bill's point in the Bible, the words used in lots of different ways, we often think of it directly tied to sin mm-hmm. and Jesus in particular saving us from sin. Mm-hmm. And then there's people that would talk about a prayer of salvation mm-hmm. or getting saved talking about not just Jesus paying for sin, but us receiving it in some way. So there's lots of different ways that it's used. What about the words, what comes to mind with words like rock or refuge? Well, rock is kind of funny because it can go either way. You know, (laughs) it's either something really solid, solid rock, you know, that you stand on, or you're rocking my boat, you know, (laughs) it it really, it can go either way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What about the word refuge? Well, A derivative of the word refuge is refugee, somebody who's seeking a safe Mm -hmm. place. So a refuge then would be the safe place that that person is looking for. Yeah. So in the psalm that we're looking at this week, Psalm 62, there's the word salvation, there's the word rock, there's the word refuge, there's the word deliverance, there's the word fortress. And I think all of them are kind of painting a picture perhaps, of one of the invitations from God to wait in silent rest Mm -hmm. for him. So let's read the psalm again, Psalm 62, and listen for rock, refuge, salvation, deliverance, and just listen for that. And perhaps I missed some of the strong language about strong places in this too. But listen for those words. Elisa, will you get us started? Okay. This is Psalm 62. For God alone, my soul waits in silence. From him comes my salvation. He alone is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall never be shaken. How long will you assail a person? Will you batter your victim, all of you, as you would a leaning wall, a tottering fence? Their only plan is to bring down a person of prominence. They take pleasure in falsehood. They bless with their mouths, but inwardly they curse. Selah. For God alone my soul waits in silence, for my hope is from him. He alone is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be shaken. On God rests my deliverance and my honor. My mighty rock, my refuge is in God. Trust in him at all times, O people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. Selah. Those of low estate are but a breath. Those of high estate are a delusion. In the balances they go up. They are together lighter than a breath. Put no confidence in extortion and set no vain hopes on robbery. If riches increase, do not set your heart on them. Once God has spoken, twice I have heard this, that power belongs to God and steadfast love belongs to you, O Lord, for you repay to all according to their work. All right, where do you see the words salvation and deliverance first? In the first verse, uh, yep. mm-hmm. actually, he says, from him comes my salvation. And then right next to it, he alone is my rock in my salvation. Yeah. So there we get the bridge of the ideas between rock and salvation. And then he goes on, my fortress, mm-hmm. I shall never be shaken. Where else do we see it? Well, you come down into verse six. Mm-hmm. He alone is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. Verse 7, my mighty rock, my refuge is in God. And verse 8, God is a refuge for us. Yeah. So 
a lot of language about rocks and refuges. Mm -hmm. If we think about, in our last conversation, we talked about waiting in silent rest for God to show up. Mm -hmm. And in this one, we kind of have this nuance of why is the psalmist waiting? It's for salvation and trusting God with that. What is he saving the psalmist from? And we don't get a complete picture, but we get some hints in here. When we get down to the end a little bit, Mm -hmm. where Rasul was reading verse 9, those of low estate are but a breath, those of high estate are a delusion. They're together lighter than a breath. And then extortion, robbery, Mm -hmm. riches, power. Yep. And those are a lot of those things are things that people tend to put hope in. Mm-hmm. So wealth or influence or inheritance. And what we're finding is that's kind of some false hope. And we're going to talk about that more as we go. What about verses three and four? What do you see there? Yeah, this is one of those mm-hmm. moments mm-hmm. where the psalmist like changes the subject of who he's addressing or, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? Like goes from, you know, this kind of description of like, God, I'm waiting for God to like, how long are you going to sell a person, you know, <laughs> you who do batter victims? Yeah. And it was like, oh, okay, we're just shifted. But it gives a sense in which, in the same way that when you're in desperation and you go from like praying to thinking about the thing that really is vexing you, is troubling yeah. you, then your attention immediately goes to the person who's maybe doing wrong. And it seems like that becomes the focus yeah. in that. In those so verses. in verses three to four there, how long will you assail a person? Will you batter your victim, all of you, as you would a leaning wall, a tottering fence? Their only plan is to bring down a person of prominence. He's not talking to God. Right. Mm-hmm. Well, he is in verse four, I think. In verse four, he changes from you to they. Okay. Mm-hmm. So it seems like he turns his attention back to God. And it's almost like verses one and two are there because of what's going on in verses three and four. The the things that he's experiencing in verses three or four are the trigger for him to wait in silence for God. So there's some kind of suffering the psalmist mm-hmm. is going through in verse three, being assailed, being battered mm-hmm. like a leaning wall, yeah. a tottering fence. And it feels like some kind of onslaught where it just keeps coming and keeps coming Mm -hmm. and keeps coming. And we don't know who the person or people are that are assailing the psalmist. We don't know much context for that. So we kind of have to guess Mm -hmm. what, what it is in that context. It could be someone literally trying to take away the throne and become king. It could be enemies outside of mm. Israel that are attacking Israel or whatever. We don't really know. But what I what I see there is just this like continual onslaught. And sometimes when we're in painful situation, it just feels like it never ends. It just mm-hmm. keeps coming and keeps coming and keeps coming. Yeah. So much so that how does he describe himself? Like a leaning wall or yeah. a tottering, yeah, tottering fence, fence, right? That's really... I, I picture a fence that's all bent over and <laughs> yeah. falling apart. And as you were talking about that and just the onslaught, it kind of reminded me of Job chapter 1 where the guy comes and says, this is what happened to this part of your possessions. Yeah. And while he was still speaking, <laughs> this happened in another place. And oh, while gosh. he was still speaking, this yes. it's just like Ugh. he doesn't even have time to recover from one blow and then the next one's there. Yeah. And I love how we can picture this small wall. Like if you've watched one of those shows where they're redoing the inside of a house and there's a wall they need to tear down, or they just keep hitting it and keep hitting it and keep hitting it Mm -hmm. until it falls or Mm -hmm. fixing a yard and the fence is leaning and they're like, we need a new fence. And so what do they do? They start kicking it right with their feet or whatever until it falls. How is that in contrast With that unsettledness, that leaning, the tottering, how is that in contrast to how he describes God? He's a fortress. You run into him. I think about the the name of the Lord is a strong tower and the righteous Mm -hmm. will run into it and be safe. And it's a fortress that protects and and houses us. Yeah, a fortress, a refuge, Mm -hmm. a rock. Mm -hmm. What is it about that type of a place that would make it a place that would be comforting in a setting like this? Well, you know, it's a place that is built to withstand Mm -hmm. opposition from an enemy and to protect people, you know, militarily. You think about a fortress. And so it's built to protect versus like a leaning fence, a leaning wall. You know, it's like, okay, I'm not walking under that because it's about to go down any moment now. It feels temporary. And within are defenses, usually, you know, weapons, Mm -hmm. troops and usually provisions. 
can mm-hmm. take a breath, get a bite to eat. There's a, a safety in it. Yeah, safety mm-hmm. and oftentimes, at least how movies and stuff portray it, is that's the first place they can finally fall asleep and mm-hmm. get some rest mm-hmm. after mm-hmm. all that they've mm-hmm. experienced. Yeah, I was thinking of Lord of the Rings, the Two Towers, and the Kingdom of Rohan, when they're under attack, they flee to the keep. Mm -hmm. the place where they can be kept safe. Yeah, and so what we see in this beautiful picture of who our God is, is all of us experience these times in our lives where the onslaught just keeps going Mm -hmm. and it's overwhelming to us. And we feel like that leaning fence that everyone who walks by gives it a good kick (laughs) to try to knock it down. And what we find is this beautiful description of who God is in contrast to the insecurity and instability that we often experience in the world. He's this rock. He's Mm -hmm. this refuge. And I think this is in some ways kind of the key to what it looks like to wait in silent rest for God, because unless we can trust him to be that rock and that refuge, unless we can find him to be that place of safety that was built for our protection, as you said, Rasul, It'd be really hard to wait in silent rest for him. But if we can see him as that God who is trustworthy, then even in the worst the world has to offer, we can sit and rest in Mm. silent waiting for God. Yeah, that really is the key to our being able to do this, to believe that God is trustworthy and then to put our trust in him with everything, especially those things that we can't fix. That trust is the foundation And uh, we'll be finding in this psalm some reasons why we can trust God and wait in silent rest for him. Well, this is the Discover the Word podcast, the small group Bible study in which on this episode, Daniel Ryan Day, Elisa Morgan, Bill Crowder, and Rasul Berry are in Psalm 62, talking about waiting in silent rest for God. Now, doing the study of Psalm 62 made me think of another study that we did a few years ago that I think you'd really find helpful. It's called How to Read the Psalms. And it was an extended how-to study that was almost like a seminar on the background, structure, genre, just things that when you know them, it actually makes the Psalms come alive in new ways. Daniel guided Elisa and Bill and Marta Hahn as they explored and explained how The poems in the book of Psalms are organized to cover different time periods in Israel's history. Did you ever notice that the Psalms are divided into five books? Look at your Bible. In the heading of Psalm 1, it says, Book 1. And so what's that all about? Well, this series changed how I think about and how I read the Psalms. It really did. I think it's one of our must-listens for Discover the Word group members, how to read the Psalms. It's in the archive part of our discovertheword.org website. So just click on the archive dropdown when you go to discovertheword.org. It's up at the top of the page. And then type how to read the Psalms into the search box. You'll be taken to that 25 conversation series that I hope will make a difference for you too. And now let's head back to the table for more of this study of Psalm 62. This is going to be a tough question and perhaps a pretty deep one. Uh, So you might have to think about it for a bit. So what is something in your life that you put hope in and at some point realized that was not a good thing to put hope in? So in other words, you discovered it was a false hope. For me, I think of the many times in my life where my wife and I and our kids have been like financially strapped and it's been pretty stressful. And I mean, like, I can't buy a Snickers bar stretched, you know, those Mm -hmm. times where you're like, that's all I need is a Snickers and you can't. Mm -hmm. Um, And so as a result, I've thought a lot about financial management. I've read a lot of books about financial peace, and I've tried to put a lot of these practices into place so that we have a savings account, an emergency fund and all that stuff. So guess what happened just about the time that I felt like I had enough in my emergency fund and savings account that we were finally getting ahead? The economy crashed. Nope. Uh, It did for us. But (laughs) but let me me describe how. Our hot water heater went out, our washing machine went out, and our microwave died on the same day. Wow. Oh, I'm not done. Oh, no. The next day, (laughs) our furnace went out. Just FYI, for those who don't know, I live in Michigan. You don't need AC in Michigan. Some people would say you do. You really don't. 
You need a furnace. Yeah. <laughs> a couple months later, we found mold in a bathroom and had to tear out a lot of the bathroom and replace that because mm. you can't just leave mold in mm-hmm. a bathroom. Mm-hmm. And while we were finishing that project, a basement room flooded. Mm-hmm. So oh. guess what happened to all that hope I had put in that emergency fund? It sounds like you bought a money pit. <laughs> <laughs> that's, <laughs> like, really? that's definitely how it felt <laughs> that week. Yeah, so it was interesting just through the gift of that experience, and I can say that a little bit now, even though it still hurts, is I just discovered how much hope and trust I had put in Mm -hmm. those accounts. And I realized how false of a hope that was when they were all gone. But isn't it good that you did that? Yeah, I was going to yeah, say. Yeah, I know, it, right? I mean, it, was, <laughs> it may it may not have helped afterwards, but when you're in the middle of it, it was yeah. protective to uh-huh. an extent. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, what what comes to mind for you? I used to put my hope in the idea of if I treated people well and was a nice person, they would like me. <laughs> <laughs> and over time, realizing that was a false hope because one, people are fickle, and they're just sometimes. Yeah oil and water dynamics there's just sometimes folks just have it out for you for whatever reasons even your niceness activates or triggers something in Mm -hmm. them (laughs) that (laughs) receives it differently and i had to really tear that hope down and put it Mm -hmm. in god as Mm -hmm. being the one who accepts me Mm -hmm. not people yeah Yeah, that last part god being the one that accepts me not people Mm -hmm. i went to bible college and graduated Ten years later, I went back to school to go to seminary to get my master's because I felt like a lot of people from West Virginia, I kind of have this overgrown inferiority complex. And I kind of felt like if I just get my master's degree, Mm -hmm. then people will respect me and stuff like that. And so I went to seminary to get my master's. And I was about halfway through the program. And it was all of a sudden as if I realized I didn't come here to get a degree. I came here to see if I could compete at that level. Mm -hmm. And once I'd figured out I could compete at that level, then I didn't need the degree. (laughs) Wow. Uh, I don't know if that's the same kind of thing or not. Uh, My children are adopted, and I remember waiting for them. I waited a long time, four and a half, almost five years for our first child. And I remember one time when I was praying, I was became conscious of my expectation and I was like floored by it. And so I said it to God, I was like, I can't wait to fill the holes in this child and mm-hmm. to convince them that they are loved mm-hmm. after their experience of being separated from their biological parents. And, you know, this was a moment when I felt the Holy Spirit just teach me. You know, Elisa, by the time that child is placed in your arms, he or she will already have experienced the greatest loss of their life. Hmm. You can't fix that. And there was a humility that came. God can Mm -hmm. heal, but I, my love can't fix that. And that expectation changed how I approached parenting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. And Bill, to your point of, I don't know if that answers the question or not. I think for all of us, there's something within our spirit where we identify, even if we're not good at communicating it, ooh, I put the wrong kind of hope in that. Yeah. And so I trust the answer you gave, regardless of what criteria we would need. And I would invite anybody as they're listening and participating with us, like there's not some special criteria for when we have officially have a false hope or not. We know in our spirit, in our gut, when man, I've put my desire for salvation in this thing. And now I find out that it can't rescue me. Mm -hmm. And so let's read Psalm 62 again. Listen for the word of hope. Last time we talked about rock, refuge, fortress as it relates to salvation and God's rescue. Now let's listen with those same words, but listen for hope. And also listen maybe as we get to the second half of this Psalm for those things that we tend to put false hope in. So Elisa, will you get us started? Sure. For God alone, my soul waits in silence. From him comes my salvation. He alone is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall never be shaken. How long will you assail a person? Will you batter your victim, all of you, as you would a leaning wall, a tottering fence? Their only plan is to bring down a person of prominence. They take pleasure in falsehood. They bless with their mouths, but inwardly they curse. Selah. For God alone my soul waits in silence, for my hope is from him. He alone is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. 
I shall not be shaken. On God rests my deliverance and my honor. My mighty rock, my refuge is in God. Trust in him at all times, O people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. Selah. Those of low estate are but a breath. Those of high estate are a delusion. In the balances they go up. They are together lighter than a breath. Put no confidence in extortion and set no vain hopes on robbery. If riches increase, do not set your heart on them. Once God has spoken, twice I have heard this, that power belongs to God and steadfast love belongs to you, O Lord, for you repay to all according to their work. Yeah, so in the beginning, for God alone, my soul waits in silence. From him comes my salvation. And then he almost restarts the psalm in verse 5. For God alone, my soul waits in silence. For my hope is from him. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting, too, because depending on the translation you're looking at, in the NIV, read verse 5 for us, Elisa, and listen to how he's talking about his soul. Sure. Yes, my soul, find rest in God. My hope comes from him. Yeah, so he like starts talking to his soul in that version of the translation versus mine where it's still kind of more generic of mm-hmm. outside of that. But what are some of the things that we see, especially in the second half, that we have a tendency to put hope in? Well, he talks about riches increasing. Mm-hmm. And I guess for me, Daniel, and you can feel free to push back on this, but I guess for me, it's not just the riches, it's the attitude toward them. If we see this as this is my ticket out or whatever, then maybe that's a unhealthy thing. But if we see it as God's provision, oh, that's good. then yeah. I don't know how that could be bad. Yeah, but even in the way you just described that, who's the focus? The riches are God. Mm. Yeah. Right? And so, good. and what we see in here is speaking of setting your heart, verse 10, if riches increase, do not set your heart mm-hmm. on them. Mm -hmm. which I would say in my beginning story, that was what the problem was. It wasn't that I had built a savings account. It's that I had set my heart on that savings account. Whereas look at that compared to earlier, verse 8. Rasul, read verse 8 for us. Trust in him at all times, O people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. Mm -hmm. So we have that difference of where our heart is Mm -hmm. focused Is our trust on God? Mm -hmm. Is our heart poured out to him? Mm -hmm. Or is it on the riches itself that Mm -hmm. have increased? You know, just to pause on that for a minute, you know, I'm in an older generation now and I have a lot of friends in older generations that are trying to decide when do they retire? When did they take social security, et cetera? And we hear a lot of, oh, I'm going to wait till I'm 70, I get full benefits or whatever decision they've come to. And there's this kind of sigh of relief. And yet... We also hear rumblings of, will Social Security still be there when Mm -hmm. I retire? And I can hear that tug of war going on inside my heart of, well, I'm going to be fine because this is what I have set aside. But the reality is, even if Social Security takes away, do I trust in God to provide? Yeah. Yeah, that's a real everyday issue for a lot of us. Absolutely. That's good, Elisa. But one of the things that jumped out to me is this pour out your heart, which mm-hmm. seems to be imagery from the Jewish sacrificial system. Mm. There were pour offerings yeah. where they would take wine or some liquid and pour it on the altar as a sacrifice. And I'm wondering if that to a Jewish mm. audience would trigger that when I pour my heart out, I'm not just pouring out all the stuff that bothers me. I'm pouring my heart yeah. itself as the sacrifice. Onto the altar. And, it, and yeah. it also shows me how, whereas in the first few verses we talked about in verse three um and four that the enemy was from without right Mm -hmm. and the latter part the enemy is from within it's Mm -hmm. what do i put my confidence in and it specifically deals with this aspect of finances and either the temptation to exploit people as we see the lowest people they are but a breath it's like man they're in a very precarious situation And there's a tendency or a temptation for people to play with the balances Mm -hmm. of scales, which Mm -hmm. was basically another way of saying corruption, verse Mm -hmm. 10, extortion and robbery. And he's saying, Mm -hmm. don't pour your heart into those things because those are not your salvation. And they also reflect the opposite of what God's generous spirit is because it's actually taking away from people who have need. Wow. Yeah. That's right. Absolutely. That's mm. really good. And that mm-hmm. reminds me of verse seven. If somebody would read that for us again. 
On God rests my deliverance and on my who? honor. On, on God. Who? On God. God. <laughs> well, and it, as counterintuitive as that is, in our culture, who do we put all the emphasis on rescuing? Me. It's ourselves, right? <laughs> yep. Like figure it out totally, for yourself, totally. build the savings account, make it happen, rescue, whatever. We put it all on ourselves and here the psalmist is saying, no, it's it's on God. And he's probably reminding himself because maybe he has the same temptation yeah. of trying to fix it himself. No, no, it's on God, rest my deliverance. And every time we've read through this psalm so far, when I've come to verse seven, I've kind of gotten stuck there on that very phrase, on God, rest my deliverance and my honor. Yeah. Now, those seem to be such radically different things. I mean, my deliverance is the rescue that God gives me, but my honor yeah, and we're in an honor and shame culture mm-hmm. here. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so by being a tottering fence, being unstable, by potentially looking a lot like the prodigal son who was in the pigsty and had lost everything, you lose a lot of honor yeah. in yeah. situations in that. And so how would they often try to get honor back? It was, well, I'll get into an honor shame contest with someone and try to win back some of my honor or make it happen. But who does the psalmist say that his deliverance and honor comes from? It's on God. And notice the word rests. Mm -hmm. So at the very beginning of the psalm, it talks about, for God alone, my soul waits or rests in silence. Here, it's kind of a repeating of that idea that on God rests my deliverance and my honor. So if we think about that, you know, we live in a world full of ideas that are built on finding hope and rest and happiness <laughs> and financial peace. And I think the really good news about this psalm is that we discover that there's only one true source of hope. And so part of waiting in silent rest for God is noticing where our defaults lead us to false hope and instead finding God to be our safe place to be our rock, our refuge, our fortress, and our salvation. When in your life have you needed God to be a God of power? And maybe another way to ask it is, when did you find God's almightiness or his strength to be comforting? I was pastoring a small church in Southern California, and the day we landed there, my family and I, my secretary picked us up and she took Marlene and the kids to the house and then took me to the office. And we got to the office and there was a tag on the door from the city saying, if somebody from this organization isn't in our office by the end of business today, we're shutting you down for building code violations. Okay. (laughs) I mean, I literally just got off the plane. And so we went up there to the city and I talked to the people. I said, you got to give me some time to catch up. I Mm -hmm. just got here. Mm -hmm. And through the course of the next six months, we were in this battle with the building and zoning commission over whether we'd be allowed to stay in this facility or not. And it all came to a head at a city council meeting. And I was allowed to address the city council. And our real estate attorney told us that in the history of California, there had never been a city council that had overturned a judgment from their building and zoning Mm. committee. And so almost our whole church showed up Mm. in the council chambers (laughs) that night. And they were all sitting there praying. And I just told them why we were there and why we wanted to be allowed to stay there. Mm. And then a guy from the city stood up and said to the city council, you know, I was here when these regulations were drafted and I was a part of drafting them. I've got to tell you, I don't believe they're being applied fairly in this case. And the city council overturned Hmm. the building and zoning commission. And they gave us some things we had to do to bring the building up to code, but we were allowed to stay there. And it was one of those where, you know, the proverb says the King's hearts in the hand of the Lord and he Mm -hmm. turns it like a river Mm -hmm. of water. And I thought, God did that. (laughs) There's no other explanation. God did that. Wow. I think about a night when I flew from Denver to LAX and then was to fly on to Melbourne, Australia for our daily bread to speak at a women's conference. And I had talked with my husband in LAX. My layover was delayed and just had a great chat with him, you know, as you do, and got on the plane. When I landed, my phone had like five messages from Evan saying, call me. I have to give you an update on my health. 
<sighs> I pulled over my big two-week luggage into the arrivals area and called Evan. He was in ICU in that amount of time. That, you know, 12, whatever, 13-hour flight it was. He had blown a fever, somehow had contracted a horrific infection in his blood, and they were talking about amputating his leg. Turned out he had necrotizing fasciitis. And, you know, you can't just turn around and go right back to the United right. States. You've got to wait to the next cycle of flights because it's a huge time difference. And that was so difficult. You know, how would I get on another flight? Would our daily bread be able to provide a substitute or a solution for my lack of presence? Most important, would they be able to isolate the particular bacteria because they have to find the particular antibiotic to treat the particular bacteria in time hmm. to save his leg? And they did. And I was able to get back within about uh, 48, 72 hours. And I'm so grateful. And Evan did fine. It was a long period of IV antibiotics, you know, from home. But he did fine. Wow. So I saw God work there. And I, there was actually a picture on the wall in the room I was staying the, the night or two I was there. And it was five stones in a row. <laughs> and I was sitting on the floor praying. And I looked up at those stones and I thought about David with Goliath. And I just, I prayed really specifically, Lord, please let the first stone work. Mm. So it was a really concrete time to watch his oh, provision. Wow. Mm. Yeah, I remember nothing that dramatic, but it was the simplest and earliest time that I had just started, you know, walking with Jesus when I was in high school and I was at church and, you know, the collection plate was getting brought past and I really felt led to give what I had. I only mm. had a $10 bill. So I literally didn't even know how I was going to get home because I was going to take the subway, the Gosh. bus. And so I gave it, someone gave me a ride home. And when I got home, there was a $10 bill in my bed. <laughs> oh and it was like, goodness. okay, God, I get the point. <laughs> oh, I got goosebumps. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's a good one. What I love about all three of those mm. stories is they're those highlight moments in our lives where mm -hmm. God shows up in a very real way. And it changes the way that we see things. Mm -hmm. I bet if we went back around the circle, we could also think of those times where we wanted God to show up <laughs> in the way that we expected. Mm -hmm. And then he didn't for some reason or not. And yet God being a God of power is comforting in those moments too. Mm -hmm. Because in the moments when things don't work out the way we expect, we can trust that, well, he's stronger than I am. He has better perspective than yeah. I do. Perhaps he's doing something that I can't see, and I can trust that too. Yeah. And so that can be good news as well, even when it doesn't work out the way that we want. Yeah, in one sense, like with the cases we talked about, you come out of it celebrating God's power and his provision. In the other sense, you come out of it trusting in his wisdom and his purposes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In Psalm 62, as it keeps describing waiting for God in silence, resting in God as we wait for him, it talks about God as a God of power. And we're going to see that at the very end. So listen for that as we read through this again. Elisa, if you could get us started, that'd be great. For God alone, my soul waits in silence. From him comes my salvation. He alone is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall never be shaken. How long will you assail a person? Will you batter your victim, all of you, as you would a leaning wall, a tottering fence? Their only plan is to bring down a person of prominence. They take pleasure in falsehood. They bless with their mouths, but inwardly they curse. Selah. For God alone my soul waits in silence, for my hope is from him. He alone is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be shaken. On God rests my deliverance and my honor. My mighty rock, my refuge is in God. Trust in him at all times, O people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. Selah. Those of low estate are but a breath. Those of high estate are a delusion. In the balances they go up. They are together lighter than a breath. Put no confidence in extortion and set no vain hopes on robbery. If riches increase, do not set your heart on them. Once God has spoken, twice I have heard this, that power belongs to God and steadfast love belongs to you, O Lord, for you repay to all according to their work. Where do you see the concept of power in this? 
Well, every time he's calling on God for deliverance, he's yeah. recognizing God's power and appealing to it. Yeah. In verse 11 specifically, once God has spoken, twice I have heard this, that power belongs to God. Mm-hmm. That's it's like an, he's reminding himself. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's kind of an interesting, mm-hmm. it's like, wait, did God speak once? Mm-hmm. And then someone else told him, did God speak twice? Yeah. But he's doing like a literary technique. Yeah. What's going on I there? Think, I think it's a poetic device. You yeah. see it in Proverbs where it says, six things does the Lord hate? Yes, even seven are an abomination. Mm-hmm. I think it's just a poetic device. So it's like building on it yeah. over and over. Yeah, and that's exactly what I was thinking too, especially because there's quite a few places in the Old Testament where there's this little formula to give extra weight, and it's like X plus one. And we actually see that a few times huh. in this passage. So we see mm-hmm. once plus twice, or we see spoken plus heard, mm-hmm. or we see power plus love, and love we're going to talk about in our last conversation on this series. Or rock plus salvation. Or rock plus salvation. Yeah. Or salvation yep. plus hope. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. So we see that a lot in this. And, and the technique there is bringing extra emphasis or strength to it. So sometimes we talk about when the Bible says something three times, we should pay attention because it gives extra weight. This is another one of those formulas that's used to give mm-hmm. extra weight. As the psalmist kind of brings this con- inclusive statement about who this God is that we're waiting for, which is a God of power and a God of love. Hmm. What's interesting is he's also quoting, or at least alluding to, if nothing else, Exodus chapter 15, verse 13, if somebody could read that for us. And I think you'll hear kind of similar language. Got it. In your steadfast love, you led the people whom you redeemed. You guided them by your strength to your holy abode. Yeah, and so in Exodus 15, of course, what's the context for that? That's the song of Moses after mm-hmm. they've come through the Red Sea. Yeah, and so they've seen God's power in a very real way on display for all to see, and not just for them, but for mm-hmm. the people of Egypt to see as well. And it's that same rhythm of steadfast love and power together. And here we have in Psalm 62 mm-hmm. this idea of steadfast love and power belonging to God. We also see, though, the misuse of power in this Mm -hmm. psalm. Where do we see that? Uh, Rasul, you alluded to that in our last conversation. Right. In verse 3, how long will you assail a person? Mm -hmm. Will you batter your victim as you would a tottering fence? So, like, there's a sense of vulnerability that he's asking, will someone exploit? And then in verse 10, in particular, he talks about putting no confidence in extortion, Mm -hmm. which is essentially blackmailing someone to get money from them because I have something over you that I can use, or robbery, which Mm -hmm. is just going up to someone and using your power to take what they have and make it yours. Yeah, I think both of those are really interesting concepts. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, it speaks again to the heart of the issue. What kind of heart puts confidence in extorting money from another person? Mm -hmm. Or what kind of person puts confidence in robbing from another person? It seems to be kind of the antithesis of the heart that would put their confidence and trust in God. And I hadn't really noticed verse 4. It hits me now as you're talking, Bill. Their only plan is to bring down a person, take pleasure in falsehood, Mm -hmm. bless with their mouths, but inwardly their curse. So not only a financial thing, but there is a reputation, a falsehood going out, speaking Mm -hmm. ill against people. Yep, to try to kind of attack them from behind, Mm -hmm. stab them in the back. Take them down. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, and so we see a lot of misuse of power here. So why for the psalmist would it be really good news that God is a God of power? Mm -hmm. Because he's also a God of justice Mm -hmm. and he's also a God of love. So however he chooses to exercise his power, it's going to be both right and good. Mm -hmm. That's exactly right. And perhaps corrective and restorative salvation oriented. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's good. Did you have something? I saw you looking. Yeah, just that power belongs to God. So Mm -hmm. it's not just that God has power, but ultimately he is the source of true power. Yeah. Mm. And that's really good news for us that live in a world where things are always out of our control. Mm -hmm. (laughs) It's really good news to know that God is a God of power and a God of strength. And part of waiting in silent rest for God is the humble recognition that we are powerless, but God is powerful and he is on our side. And That's really good news, but it gets even better. And we'll see that in our final conversation. It gets even better. I like that. 
You're listening to the Discover the Word podcast, the small group Bible study from Our Daily Bread Ministries. And in this episode, Daniel Ryan Day is guiding a study of Psalm 62 with Elisa Morgan, Bill Crowder, and Rasul Berry. And so what is the even better in the last couple of verses of the psalm? That's what we'll find out in just a moment. So what's next for the group on the Discover the Word podcast? Well, Rasul will be leading the group in a study of some things about the life of the Apostle Peter called Answer the Call. Let me just ask you, have you ever had a phone call that changed your life? Oh, I see a a big nod there, (laughs) Aliso. Yeah, I think we can all think of the story of a memorable phone call that was part of a life-altering part of our own life story. Well, obviously, Peter didn't have a phone, but he did get a call from Jesus. And picking up and answering that call was life-changing. Well, next time on the Discover the Word podcast, Rasul wants the group to think about what it means for us when we get that call from Jesus. And that's what we'll see with the call, that for all of us, there's a sense of fear, Mm -hmm. but then there's also this sense of God's presence that allows us to go deeper into a relationship with him and deeper into a sense of vision for what he would have for our life than we could ever imagine. Answer the call next time on the Discover the Word podcast. And now the conclusion of this study of Psalm 62 and waiting in silent rest for God. So let's just revisit where we've been so far in these conversations. What's jumped out to you? Mm. Psalm 62 is a pretty cool psalm. That's what's jumped (laughs) out to me. Um, It makes me kind of pause with every single wait I'm going to experience and think, oh, am I doing this in silence? (laughs) And what am I learning? Yeah. I can pour out my heart to other people. I can pour out my heart to solutions I try to manufacture, or I can pour my heart out before him, Mm. before God. Mm. And that's, you know, ultimately where I can find refuge. Mm. Yeah, that's really good. I think for me, the reason I was drawn to this in the first place is because we live in such a world of words and people are always giving advice and you can Google anything And even in our Christian circles, we think about prayer. It's always, hey, let me pray for you. And then it's all these words. Mm -hmm. And there's a little bit of a invitation here that actually silence and resting in God, there's something really good and helpful in that too. And obviously, like we talked about, words are important. And that's a really good invitation too. Hence the Psalm itself that we're reading (laughs) (laughs) is words. Mm -hmm. But even just that idea of waiting in silent rest for God is just very counterintuitive and countercultural to what we typically think about. Mm -hmm. We just finished our last conversation talking about how God is not just our salvation, he's not just our hope, but he's also a God of power. But in the words of Bill Crowder, wait, there's more. (laughs) Yeah, I originated Uh, that. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, you do, I'm sure. (laughs) You do say it sometimes on the show. I have said it before. Yeah, that's why I'm throwing it out there for you. Mm -hmm. The psalm ends in such an amazing way, and we haven't really gotten to jump into this as much yet, but it focuses in on God's steadfast love as one of the final ideas, which is one of my favorite words in the whole Bible. So let's read Psalm 62 and just listen for those words, steadfast love, which we'll hear toward the end of the psalm. Elisa, will you get us started? For God alone, my soul waits in silence. From him comes my salvation. He alone is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall never be shaken. How long will you assail a person? Will you batter your victim, all of you, as you would a leaning wall, a tottering fence? Their only plan is to bring down a person of prominence. They take pleasure in falsehood. They bless with their mouths, but inwardly they curse. Selah. For God alone my soul waits in silence, for my hope is from him. He alone is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be shaken. On God rests my deliverance and my honor. My mighty rock, my refuge is in God. Trust in him at all times, O people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. Selah. Those of low estate are but a breath. Those of high estate are a delusion. In the balances they go up. They are together lighter than a breath. Put no confidence in extortion and set no vain hopes on robbery. If riches increase, do not set your heart on them. 
Once God has spoken, twice I have heard this, that power belongs to God and steadfast love belongs to you, O Lord, for you repay to all according to their work. Hmm. It's interesting, Daniel, how his target audience varies from verse to verse. Mm -hmm. At one point he's talking to himself, at another point he's talking to the audience, at another point he's talking to God, at another point he's talking to his adversaries. So Mm -hmm. there's a lot of intricate communication going on Yeah, you gotta pay attention to your pronouns here. Yeah. Yeah, and I think I hear an invitation just in that alone. Oftentimes we always try to get the right words in the right order. (laughs) And this is messy Mm -hmm. in that way. And that's actually good news for us too, because sometimes when we're in a spot, where we feel like a tottering fence or a leaning wall and everybody that comes by is trying to kick us down, I think we're thankful we don't have to get all the words right and mm-hmm. in the right order in order for God to hear us or, or whatever. Yeah, sometimes we're like, you know, the kid when <laughs> he gets upset and, and then he hit me and yeah. I'm sad and, I, you know, <laughs> it hurt. And, yeah. you know, and it's just like all over the place. But you're just, okay, come here. It's yep. going to be okay. Aww, that's that's cool. right. Where did we see the phrase steadfast love show up? Last verse. Yeah. And let's read 11 and 12 together again, just because this is kind of a poetic thing where it includes steadfast love as an important piece of these final two verses. Mm. So, Rasul, if you'll just read verses 11 and 12 for us. Once God has spoken, twice have I heard this, that power belongs to God and steadfast love belongs to you, O Lord for you repay to all according to their work. Okay, anybody else put that last line? Just just like, why do you end there? We're going to get there. Hold on, hold on to that. Okay, I've read it like 12 Um, times Because that's a really important one. (laughs) But again, to what we were talking about a minute ago, verse 11, he's speaking to his audience, bearing Mm -hmm. witness to who God is. But in verse 12, he's talking directly to the Lord. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we were talking in our last conversation about the poetic device that, This is the concluding idea. I'm trying to bring all of this together under these two categories of God's power and God's love, both of who are kind of known and made fulfilled, come to completion in who God is. And that word steadfast love is one of my favorite Hebrew words, but instead of me geeking out, I'll just throw it out to you. You talk about it about as much as I talk about the Enneagram. Yeah, yeah that's right. So <laughs> but it's a better thing. Let's see if you've let's see if you've heard me anytime. What is that <laughs> word and what does it kind of mean? <laughs> Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, you kind of have to clear your throat to yeah, say yeah. chesed. <laughs> yeah. And what are some of the things that word can mean? Mm-hmm. It has like a pretty broad range of mm-hmm. meaning. Faithful love, mm-hmm. covenant love, loving kindness. Mm-hmm. Yep. All those things. Loyal love. Yep. Yeah. Loyal love. There's a goodness tied it's good into stuff, it. good stuff, yeah. 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 The good and stuff. And it, it doesn't just mean one of those. It kind of encompasses this whole yeah. beautiful picture of what love is. Mm-hmm. And it's God's primary characteristic in the Old Testament. Yeah. Mm-hmm. In fact, you led us through a series, Bill, on when God introduces himself as this and, and where was that and what was going on there. Exodus 34, six and seven, following the golden calf incident at Mount Sinai where the people are already breaking the first commandments that they were given. Mm-hmm. And Moses goes back up on the mountain and with the reputations of the gods of the nations and the, even the gods of Egypt, it's not a stretch to think that he was going up there expecting God to be really angry And God describes himself in Exodus 34, 6 and 7 by saying, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and compassionate and full of loving kindness for generations and generations. You know, it's just this rich statement of, okay, yeah, they messed up. I'm not through with them yet. Yeah. And you said the Lord revealing himself that way. Yeah. It's actually pretty rare in the Bible that God describes himself. Mm -hmm. And here is Mm -hmm. one of the primary times he does it. And he uses this word chesed, Mm. which is, I am this faithful, kind, compassionate, gracious, loving, loyal God. Mm. And then that word goes on to be used like 180 times in the Old Testament or something. So to me, it reminds me of in 1 John 4, 8, God's chesed in the Old Testament is like the New Testament's when John says oh. God is love, mm-hmm. yeah, agape. right? Like, yeah, and you have this description of God mm-hmm. as his primary mm-hmm. characteristic is love. And so why is it really good news that God isn't just a God of power, but also a God of steadfast love? Mm-hmm. Because that means God will use that power for good. And that's the mm-hmm. combination to that's both good. not just have the desire or the inclination to be caring, compassionate, kind, mm-hmm. but also the power to do something about it. Yeah. 
Is mm-hmm. it a weak love? Nah, it's <laughs> strong. Yeah, you think about Jesus who came to show us what the Father is like, and he exhibited that power in so many different ways. But in all of the miracles he did, there was only one miracle that was destructive, and that was the cursing of a fig tree. Mm-hmm. All the rest of them, his power was exercised to help people who were hurting or hungry or in need in some way. Mm. Yeah. So now, Elisa. Mm. Yes, now. How does that help us <laughs> think through what, for you, repay to all according to their work must mean? Well, it sounds like he will be just. Mm-hmm. It sounds like his power, and Russell, you kind of said this, his power and his steadfast love will rule and communicate and actually hold in balance. I like that previous allusion to the balance, you mm-hmm. know, because that really is how we see justice is a scale of balance. They will hold his justice in balance for good purposes in repaying all of these people who want to victimize and these people who want to be falsehood and steal and extort, etc. He will repay them all according to their work. Yeah, there's an aspect of fairness. I think about even in Exodus 34, which we kind of alluded to when it says that God is merciful and gracious. It also says keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin and that will by no means clear mm-hmm. the guilty. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so there's a sense of justice that those who are being extorted, those who you know were being robbed, that that's not the final say. Yeah. Yeah, I think about Psalm 67, where in Psalm 67, the psalmist is encouraging Israel to tell the world about their great God and all that he is so that the nations will celebrate him. And the specific thing he wants them to celebrate is his justice. Yes. Which is not the first thing that pops to our minds, but in a world full of injustice, having a God of justice is a really good thing. Yeah, Yeah, and just to be fair, maybe it should be the first thing to pop to our minds. You know, we who live on this planet in a favored, if you will, privileged capacity can lose respect for the need of justice. And that's one of the most beautiful attributes of God Mm -hmm. that we need to remember and hold up, that he he really does hold his power and his steadfast love with his justice. Yeah, it kind of reminds me, and we see it again, going back to the kid who is crying (laughs) and (laughs) whispering about somebody hitting them. They're going to that parent. They're going to that mother or father Mm -hmm. because they're like, do something about Mm -hmm. this. Make this right. Make this right. And they don't want to just hear, well, honey, life's not fair. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. (laughs) Even though it isn't. Right. (laughs) Right. They also want to hear, come here, Johnny, and you're going to say say sorry. Time out. There's consequences. And that makes me feel like the world is safe. I'm cared for. I'm loved. Mm -hmm. And everything's going to be all right. Yeah. So when we read those words, for you repay to all according to their work. It can feel threatening to us in some way unless we realize that somehow that is an outpouring of God's strength Mm -hmm. and love Mm -hmm. together. Mm -hmm. It's not just his strength and it's not just his love. It's his strength and his love together. And in some ways, I mean, you could read back through this whole psalm and you can see him describing those who reap what they sow, right? Those who are Mm -hmm. pouring their heart out in riches are finding that they've put their hope in the wrong thing and there is no hope there. And so in that way too, it's like, yeah, you are going to get also what you put your hope in. And so of course the heart behind this psalm is waiting in trust for God. And so for us, as we think about this psalm and just the craziness in our lives and the craziness of the world that we live in, May we hear God's invitation in this psalm to not trust in ourselves or anything else that the world offers. May we trust not in our ability to even say the right words or do the right things for God, or to even force ourselves into some right understanding, quote unquote, of who he is, as if that's the only way we have access to him. Instead, may we hear this invitation to wait in silent rest for God. And perhaps that's why, as Bill, you mentioned in one of our conversations that Jesus said to his followers, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden. Mm -hmm. And what? I will give you rest, my rest. And so maybe today would be a good time to start, to take just a few minutes and await in silent rest for God. And trust that in doing that, we aren't wasting our time, but we're actually committing to trust God more. It's surprisingly challenging at first, and then there are always going to be things that will pull us in other directions, but waiting in silent rest for God needs to be part, a big part, of how we respond to life. 
We're glad you're able to be part of the group for this study of Psalm 62 and waiting in silent rest for God. Lisa Morgan, Bill Crowder, Daniel Ryan Day, and Rasula Berry have been your study partners for these conversations. Discover the Word is a small group Bible study from Our Daily Bread Ministries in Grand Rapids, Michigan, in which we invite you to walk with us through topics and passages that inform the way we read the scriptures, challenge us as we live our lives as followers of Christ, and always point us to discover Jesus in the pages of the Bible. Now here at Discover the Word and Our Daily Bread Ministries, it is our mission to make the life-changing story and wisdom of the Bible understandable and accessible to people all around the world. And when you give a financial gift, your donation provides the fuel that's needed to help us accomplish that mission. You can give when you visit our website at discovertheword.org. Look for the Donate tab that's up at the top of the page. Well, thanks for listening. I'm Brian Hedinga. Discover the Word is provided by Our Daily Bread Ministries.